Scott already touched on some of this uh, in describing the origins of the Eurogam project and the way it played out. But to sort of take a little bit of a step back, if you think about the British tradition when it came to gang research, was that there, there weren't any gangs, was the argument. And this was based on an understanding of youth collectives, if you will, that was really anchored in the subcultural perspectives of the Birmingham School. And there was this sort of understanding at the time that the criminal aspect of the American gang, that it was highly structured, highly organized, didn't translate to the UK. And I think what Malcolm Klein nailed with the Eurogang paradox, I think it was, it was such a great observation, was sort of two things. Number one was that that stereotype, if you will, of the American gang was itself a myth that had somehow breathed life into this idea that in order for a gang to be a gang, it had to be structured and organized and it had to have a leader and it had to be engaged in violent crime all day, every day, 24 hours a day, you know, with no exceptions. And of course, Klein's work really speaks to the idea that gang life is a boring life most of the time. Most of the time you're doing what normal young people are doing. You're standing out on street corners, you're hanging out, you're talking with your friends, you're doing things. And then, of course, there is that criminal component that comes there well, which is central to the gang. But it doesn't mean that it has to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then the other thing as well is that as a lot of research has now shown, um, particularly in the last sort of 30 years, um, that gangs also don't have to be structured and organized and have meetings and, and all the formal bureaucratic elements for it to be a gang. So that's the sort of the essence of the paradox. Now, what was interesting for me then walking into this field was in some ways as a Brit, I didn't quite know what I was getting myself in for. Uh, so I live in the United States now and I have the benefit of this sort of comparative perspective in my work where I'm able to sort of to, to play both sides. But at that time, I was 100% British born and bred. And I'm going through classes learning about subcultural theory and the criminology of you know, the 1960s and 70s, and we don't have gangs. And the conversation ended in like 1970. And it was like, did no one think to fast forward 30 years and see what we're doing now? And it seemed really strange to me that it had just been sort of assumed there's no such things as gangs in Britain because we, we dealt with that in 1966 with David Downs, we don't have to revisit it. And it was like, but it's, but it's 2010, like surely things might have changed was number one. The second thing that which was different was at Oxford, I went through a, what many would maybe class as a slightly different approach to my studies in so much that I was a sociology major for a start, not a criminology major. And also I was uh, trained by some of the kind of leading uh, experts in organized crime, illegal governance, and a different way of looking at this phenomena. So Diego Gambata, Federico Varese were the ones that were sort of having me look at this world through a very different lens. So then when I started the field work, uh, and I think later on, we're going to talk a little bit about ethnographic field work and, and stuff. So, so I'll reserve that for then. But when I started the field work and started to observe the things that I was seeing on the street, it was it made me realize exactly as Scott had described, where there is a diversity of gangs. There is variety in the way in which they operate. And it's not a case of we need to typologize them to check the box, but more a case to recognize that perhaps this group of kids over here right now isn't a gang. But with the right circumstances, or some might say the wrong circumstances, and under, the, under certain conditions, six months from now, they could be. And not only that, but if you fast forward two years from now, they might not just be a gang, 
they could actually be a full-fledged drug dealing operation. And we were sort of observing some of this in real time where I was looking at some groups in London that started off as, you know, a, a loose collective of, of kids on a street corner that no one really cared about. Within a year or two had become sort of become a named gang, were getting more involved in crime and other things. And then later down the line had fragmented, individual just spun off from that group, started their own groups. One group over here is now rivaling with the other. We now have gang rivalry because of this. And not only that, we have some of these individuals who've moved into organized crime. And so for me, it was kind of a little bit sort of shunning the British criminology a little bit and saying that I didn't see much value there. And in some ways, going right back to Thrasher and the basics and recognizing gangs evolve, they change. Um, one gang here might be different in six months and it might be doing something else. And to embrace that diversity, embrace that variety and embrace that evolution as part of the process. And if you can do that, then you start to have that appreciation for the group process, which is kind of what Scott was alluding to. And obviously a lot of his work speaks directly to and how important that is. And if you can then zero in on that group process, you can start to move away from this kind of like, is that a gang, is that a gang debate, which is really hot in Britain. I mean, still to this day, people will, they'll, they'll die on that hill to be like, there's no such thing as gangs, they don't exist. And instead to recognize that actually, once you start focusing on the group process component, and you start looking at what the gang is actually doing, not just what we call it, then you can get a little bit closer to seeing that there are similarities between the US and the UK. And there are structured gangs in the US and in the UK, but there are also lots of unstructured gangs in the US and the UK, and they are all still gangs, but they kind of exist on this evolutionary kind of spectrum. And I think that that was the aha moment for me, where we didn't have to just fit everything in that neat little box, but we could be a bit more um, out there. And in the book that we've uh, we've written on gangs, we, we really, uh, connect to that. So we even take Thrasher's spectrum of kind of gang activity and we, we reproduce that uh, classic figure in the book. We use that to have a discussion about how gangs are different from other groups, but also how there are similarities with those other groups as well. We actually dedicate a whole chapter of the book to, uh, to working through some of those issues around evolution and, and other things. So, um, so yeah, that's probably probably enough for now, uh, and we'll go for another question. But uh, but thanks.